Hey everyone, it's me, John Lorden. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch for today, September 1st. Wow, this year is flying by. Um, today we are looking into a case about another mysterious letter writer that is terrorizing people. Um, previously, you know, we've covered the Zodiac, which is a bit different because there we have a confirmed killer that's writing letters. Uh, we've previously talked about the Watcher, which I've done an update on today. You might want to check that out as well. Um, but once again, that is just someone terrorizing people specifically with letters. Today's case is a whole lot different because you have the same type of thing where uh, a town is essentially being terrorized, actually more than just the town of Circleville. Um, these letters went to other areas as well. But you have one person who is nearly killed. You have another person uh, who does die. And then you have a third person who might have gone to jail uh, and is innocent, all as the result of the Circleville letters. So very interesting case. Uh, it was even covered by Unsolved Mysteries. And guess what? Even they got a letter of their own from what is known as the Circleville Rider. So let's start with a screenshot. Uh, this is an article that was written in the Ohio Observer uh, by Martin Yant, and he is kind of one of the foremost investigators on this case. Um, he's been featured several times in articles that I've read through on this case. Uh, we're gonna hit a couple of his theories. His theories tend to evolve, it seems like, as time goes on, but he is really, dedicated and steeped in the information around this case. So uh, as any investigation naturally progresses, I'm sure that that is a, a, the natural thing to happen. Your theories might change as you get new information. Um, but here, I wanted to show you this because of this picture in the upper left. This is the actual letter that was sent to Unsolved Mysteries. And you can see they even included the envelope here as well. And it says, forget Circleville, Ohio. Do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, you El Sickos will pay. The Circleville Rider. It's a little bit threatening, uh, not quite a direct threat. But let's just take a look at some of the other. This is the type of block writing that is typically featured uh, in these letters. However, it is important to note that one of the earlier letters doesn't really match this writing. As a matter of fact, I think it's significantly different. Here's one of the earlier letters that went to a woman named Mary Gillespie. We're going to talk a whole lot about her uh, on today's episode as well. Um, the, the, the script that is being written uh, for the letters here is so different from this to this kind of block letter format. Uh, I don't know if it's the same person and they got nervous about being identified. So they decided to try to change up their writing. Maybe they're writing with their um, non-dominant hand or something along those lines. But the thing that really grabbed my eye uh, in this early letter is you've got this variation going on between see the A and stay away. We've, we've got three A's that happen up here and they are actually lowercase A's, but they've been increased in size to, um, to look like they're uppercase essentially, just from the size of them. But down here, uh, there are other A's that appear like here in please, and that has been changed to what is like a normal uh, uppercase A. It's just, it's curious to me to see that type of inconsistency within the same letter. So uh, I think that might mean that the person is being um, conscious about trying to change their writing or the style of their writing. And then maybe as it goes on, they forget about those decisions and all of a sudden they're going back to a regular uppercase A. I don't know. Um, I just, I've never quite seen that in the same letter like that before. But from that letter to these letters, I mean, the writing is substantially different. Uh, and some people might think um, perhaps there is more than one Circleville writer, but let's learn a little bit more about Circleville really quickly. Uh, jumping over to wikipedia.org, Circleville is a city in and the county seat of Pickaway County, Ohio, 
The population was 13,314 at the 2010 census. Now, these letters occurred um, starting in the mid-1970s. So if we just check out the historical population, we can see that it was about 11,000, over 11,500 back then. Still a relatively smaller uh, community. We can see it here kind of in the center of Ohio. Um, obviously known for the pumpkin show. I've <laughs> seen people in threads talking about that in a few places as well. Uh, even though the, these letters started in the mid seventies, they continued for quite a while, like 20 years. And there's a very interesting twist in the scope of those letters continuing because the person that everyone thought was doing it was incarcerated for 10 of those 20 years, but we'll get to that aspect of the story in a little bit. Uh, moving over to the lineup.com. This is a pretty good write-up. Um, I've been noticing what I consider like the blog write-up of this story. It's a little simplistic. Some of the facts don't seem to line up if you do a deeper dive in that. Um, so I'm gonna include a couple of those in the sources below. I'll try to point out if there's anything wildly inconsistent. Um, I don't think there is on this one, but let's just jump in and get started. In 1976, the citizens of Circleville, Ohio began receiving sinister handwritten letters. The anonymous author knew many personal details about each resident and claimed to be watching them. They were postmarked from nearby Columbus without a return address. Moving over to historicmysteries.com, let's learn some more. The letters contained threats of violence and personal information that in some cases only the recipient was aware of. Many of these letters were hatefully written with vulgarisms and lewd artwork. None of the Circleville letters had any return address and all appeared to come from somewhere within Columbus. Uh, I have seen a few instances of examples that also came, they were postmarked within Circleville. So not quite all of them came from Columbus, but we're talking the vast majority and we're talking a lot of letters to the tune of more than 1000 letters. Every single letter was written in the same distinct style, block letters, and might have been an attempt to cover up the author's personal handwriting. Um, I already showed you some examples where it's not every letter is written in the same exact style. As a matter of fact, some of the letters were even typewritten. Um, so just keep that in mind as we roll forward here. Even though many of the town's 14,000 inhabitants were targeted, one woman was seemingly singled out for some severe and or harsh treatment. Mary Gillespie drove a school bus for a living and was among the initial targets. In addition to revealing disturbing facts, such as her home being under surveillance by the author and that she was a married mother, the letter also contained an allegation that Gillespie was having an affair with a superintendent of schools. In no uncertain terms, the author demanded that she stop. Several additional letters were sent to her, all of a similar nature. At first, the terrified woman just hid them all away until one of the Circleville letters arrived addressed to Ron Gillespie, Mary's husband. Of course, the letter uh, wound up spilling the beans and telling Ron what his wife was up to with the superintendent. Ron was ordered to put an end to the affair or die. So we have a very direct threat here. Um, from the stuff that I've read that was sent to Mary, uh, she was not being threatened in quite that way. It was it was kind of speaking more about, I know about your children, you know, kind of assuming that there were other ways that they would be able to harm her, but not a direct threat to her. Uh, Ron was the first one that appeared to get a very direct threat where you have to do something about this or something's going to happen to you. Uh, I know about where you work. I know that you have a red and white truck, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, both Ron and Mary worked together to try and ignore the threats and intimidation and carry on. Another chilling letter quickly changed that. Gillespie, you have had two weeks and done nothing. Admit the truth and inform the school board. If not, I will broadcast it on CBs, posters, signs, and billboards until the truth comes out. Um, just you might see that it looks like it says CBS here. I've read several articles on this and seen some people even discussing the aspect. It's 
it's supposed to be CBs. <laughs> um, I don't think that a person that's trying to remain anonymous has connections at CBS where they're going to, you know, get this type of information broadcast. But um, now this article at Historic Mysteries, this this next paragraph, uh, some of this stuff is not true. So I'm actually going to read it and then tell you guys where it's incorrect because I've seen it repeated so often and I've seen other places that have better information where we know that this isn't how it happened. The couple began to deliberate about who the possible Circleville letter writer could be. Their suspicions centered on Ron's brother-in-law, Paul Freshour. No, it didn't. <laughs> not at this point. It absolutely did not. They actually invited Ron's sister and Paul, who was Ron's sister's husband, over to their home. Uh, they told them about the letters. They all thought that they knew who was writing the letters, and they decided to write that person some letters saying, hey, we know who you are. Stop doing this. And it appeared that that worked for a brief period of time, that the letters did seem to stop for a very short period of time. So uh, if you're reading up on this and you see this, that, you know, th that Ron and Mary basically thought that it was their brother-in-law right from the start, that is not accurate. And I have read plenty of information to support that that is not accurate. Uh, but let's move on. August 19th, 1977, the phone rang. Ron answered, Mary never did find out what was said or who made the call, but it was assumed to be the phantom author. Ron lost his temper, grabbed his pistol, and left the house. At an intersection close to where they lived, Ron's vehicle struck a tree and killed Ron Gillespie. When the police investigated the crash, they discovered that Ron's gun had been fired once. Detectives could find no reason or excuse for Ron to have fired at all, whether it was deliberate or not. The crash happened moments after Ron drove away, and no shot was reported. A postmortem examination recorded that Ron's blood alcohol level was one and a half times the legal limit. Um, I've seen it reported as it was at 0.16. Um, I'm very curious about the shot that was supposedly fired, and I can't find very good detail on this. Um, it, it seems like Ron got drunk, which apparently was strange for him. Um, several of his friends have noted this is not the type of guy that was a hard drinker or anything like that. Um, the phone call, did the phone call upset him uh, to the point where he felt like he had to get some liquid courage and go talk to someone about what was going on, um, possibly. That someone that he was going to talk to, he felt like he needed to be armed for some reason. Um, in the uh, Unsolved Mysteries episode, there is kind of this assumption that uh, it was definitely the uh, Circleville writer that called him and that he went and grabbed his gun, got in his truck, and went to go meet this guy person somewhere, even though the Circleville writer said that he was watching Ron's home at that time, which we're talking about 1977. You don't have cell phones. Um, and if it's someone that lived close enough to be watching Ron's home or his vehicle, why would Ron have needed to get in his truck if he knew who this person was to the point where he was going to go have a confrontation with this person and had to arm himself? There's a lot about this that really doesn't make sense. Uh, some people question if the um, investigation done by the local sheriff, uh, the same sheriff that was mentioned at the beginning of this episode in the, um, the letter that I showed you that went to Unsolved Mysteries, did they really do a good job on this investigation? Uh, I'm not sure, but what we do have is his blood alcohol level is high, his car was wrecked into a tree, uh, there was a gun with him and one of the bullets had been fired. Uh, a consideration I don't see people really talk about is what if that bullet was fired at a completely different time and he just didn't empty the mag, the, um, the empty cartridge out of the gun? What if he just left it in there because he knew he had several more shots and he just put it away in his drawer or whatever? Um, there's nothing to necessarily assume that, um, you know, he took fresh ammo and just reloaded the gun right before he got into the truck. 
if I was going to have a face off with someone, I probably would, you know, I'd probably check and make sure that there was uh, fresh ammo in the gun. But if you're drunk, are you going to necessarily think about that? I'm not sure. There's no mention of, you know, they know that he shot the bullet because they found the bullet uh, in a nearby tree, or they saw that it went through his window, or they saw that it it accidentally fired in the accident because it was jostled or something like that. There is no information about that gunshot. Uh, gunshot residue being on his hand, which I don't even think was really uh, an investigative tool back then. Nothing. So it's really, really strange. When we boil this down, we have a woman who might or might not be having an affair, someone writing letters to her family talking about this affair, uh, upsetting them so badly that uh, the husband decides that he's going to go out and talk to someone about this, and he never makes it. He basically winds up driving his truck into a tree. Or did he? Did something else happen? Was someone waiting in his truck? Um, if that person was the same person on the phone, once again, we just have to keep in mind, this couldn't have been a cell phone call. So you would have had maybe people, more than one person working together uh, if they were going to try to ambush him in some way like that or, or harm him like that, which uh, I, just, I just don't know if it's very feasible in this case. I wish of all that I've looked into with this case, I wish there was a lot more information about this crash. It'd be great to see a police report on this. Um, just to see, get a better sense of what really happened on this night, because this becomes a bit of a sticky point for his brother-in-law later. Um, and I don't know if we ever really, I don't think that anyone really has the answer to this. I don't even know if the sheriffs that investigated this really know what happened in this instance, but let's get back to the story and continue. The Circleville letters began once more in earnest as well as Mary Gillespie and her immediate family, elected officials were also targeted. Mary admitted to the affair taking place, but insisted that it only began after the first of the letters had been delivered. Um, I have read a lot of people talking about this case, analyzing this case. Nobody believes that's true. <laughs> I have not found one comment thread from anybody saying, oh, well, yeah, that seems reasonable. You start getting letters from some mystery person about you having an affair with someone. You're not having an affair with them, but after you get these letters that are threatening your family, sure, you decide to go ahead and have an affair with them. It literally does not make sense. But uh, what we do have here is her at least admitting, yes, there is an affair going on between her and the superintendent of the school. Um, let's continue. Despite all of this harassment and the scandal that made her the talk of the town, Mary managed to keep her job. Six years after the campaign had began, whoever was behind this took a bold step in furthering their tactics while at work. Mary noticed a sign on route that threatened the life of her daughter. Angered by this, she stopped the bus and removed the sign. She noticed a box tied with a string to another post. Inside was a crude booby trap in the form of a pistol. Thankfully, the trap failed to execute at all. She called the police, and they quickly discovered that someone had made a crude attempt to file off the gun's serial number, Police traced the gun to Fresh Hour, who, not for the first time, insisted he knew nothing about the events. Fresh Hour stated that the gun went missing long before. So this is a very interesting turn, um, and that was a very brief way of telling what actually happened here. Uh, she's driving the bus. She's taking kids to school. She sees this sign that mentions her daughter. Um, I've seen that it's vulgar. I've seen that it's threatening, but I have not seen the exact wording that was on the sign. Um, she goes and she sees that there is a box that is attached to this sign, but she takes the whole thing into the school bus. She doesn't open it at the side of the road. She doesn't contact police and say, hey, there's something out here that has to do with this harassment I've been going through. Can you guys check it out? And Police up to this point have talked to her about how to properly collect evidence if there's something like this going on. 
Um, for some reason, she ignores all of that, but she brings this box into the school bus. She takes the kids to school. Uh, she drives home and then decides, hey, I'm going to try to see what's in this box while I'm sitting at home. She pries the lid off. She says that it's been heavily glued and it took a lot of prying for her to pop it open. She sees a gun in there that's being held with a styrofoam, basically keeping it in the right position for shooting at the right angle. And she kind of thinks, well, it's probably not a real gun. could be a starter pistol or something along those lines. Um, and apparently she doesn't report it to police for a few hours. Some other things are going on at home. She goes through those things first and then goes, oh, well, I better take this gun or this box with a gun in it to the police. So her steps around all that um, are very questionable. And because of the fact that she moved it, um, the investigation into that area is a little bit tampered with. They still are able to go there, um, check. They find some footprints. Um, they, I think they find tire prints as well, um, but that's about it. There's nothing else really in the area that helps them determine uh, what happened there. We're going to get to some testimony from someone else um, from that morning as well that might give us a bit of clarification into it, but uh, let's continue here. Fresh Hour takes handwriting test. Police had Fresh Hour take a handwriting test in which he had to copy some of the Circleville letters. The investigation was criticized for the incorrect manner for administering the handwriting test. The sheriff was satisfied that Fresh Hour was a Circleville letter writer or that the handwriting was close enough at least, and he arrested Fresh Hour for attempted murder. The trial began in late October 1983, and even though he had an alibi for the day of the booby trap attempt on Mary's life, he was convicted. Fresh Hour maintained his innocence until his death in 2012. And what's interesting is he was incarcerated for 10 years based on that charge, and the letters continued. Letters went to the sheriff. Letters even went to Fresh Hour in jail talking to him. Um, so it's, it's pretty curious because if you look into at least what Fresh Hour says about um, the court proceedings, and he has a huge document that he has released. I think it's over 120 pages or so, 164 pages. Um, a big part of the trial and a big part of his conviction has to do with those letters and essentially getting the judge to believe that he was part of writing those letters and that those letters were written by the same person that made this sign with this booby trap. And for me, that is the weakest point of this whole case after looking into it is the association between the booby trap and the letters. Now, the thing is, there was multiple signs that were being left around supposedly by the same person that was writing the letters. But to link this one specific sign to the letter writer, uh, I haven't found anything that's been very strong in terms of deciding that. But the court of public opinion, I mean, there was articles being written about this all over the place. Uh, some of these articles actually stated that he himself had admitted to writing some of the letters and uh, he has refuted that. In his paperwork, he's very clear that he never admitted to that, that once again, this is the sheriff lying to protect a sloppy investigation and not really finding the Circleville writer. So um, very, very strange things going on in this case. While serving his time, Fresh Hour was considered to be a model prisoner. In the decade that he was incarcerated, the letters carried on regardless. All postmarked Columbus and Fresh Hour was not sentenced to prison anywhere near Columbus. Even the prison wardens doubted that Fresh Hour was guilty of writing the letters. And they had a really good reason to. Uh, not only was there strict policies about letters coming in or leaving the jail, everything is checked. Um, he was being physically checked whenever he was meeting with someone. He was strip searched before and after he would meet with them. They even had periods of time where they put him in solitary confinement specifically to make the letters stop. And the letters didn't stop. They were still going out while he was in solitary. So the authorities at the jail were convinced he is not sending these new letters. As a matter of fact, they even put him to a polygraph test and specifically asked him about those letters. Does he have anything to do with those letters? Um, 
since his incarceration, but they also touched on the letters that were brought up in his trial. He said, no, no, I, I do not have anything to do with writing those letters. And he passed. Um, take that for what it's worth, because we're talking about uh, lie detector tests. But really, really interesting stuff here. And it's just unfortunate that uh, he's no longer around to defend himself. From what I see, he did have a blog, but it looks like it's been taken down since. Um, I will have a link to his long document uh, in the description box below, so you can dive into that. If you're really going to look into this case, I think you have to go through that document. It's got pieces of the court transcripts, which it's the only location where I've been able to find that stuff. It's a little frustrating because you'll be reading a court transcript and all of a sudden it'll just stop and he'll jump to a different document or he'll jump around within the conversation. Um, but the first 30 pages are all written by him and his feelings about what's going on, that this is basically a large type of conspiracy that is going on between the sheriff and the school district and some other people all covering up these, these bad, evil things that they're doing. What's strange about what he wrote in those first 30 pages is the tone of it is basically supporting the Circleville writer. Uh, he's basically saying, hey, the stuff that this writer was saying, a lot of it is true if you actually look into it. And his letter is written to the FBI. He's trying to get the FBI to look into this at some level. Um, so it's weird because when I first started reading that letter, I was like, wow, it really seems like, you know, he's he's supporting the Circleville writer. So isn't it possible that he is actually the writer that, you know, he's trying to once again, get people to believe this message that he's putting out just in a bit of a different way. Um, however, when you consider he's in jail, the letters are still going out. He takes a polygraph, he passes, uh, it gets pretty tough. While he was in prison, he even received a letter that stated, now, when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all. Um, that letter strikes me a little weird. Um, is he trying to make it sound like, I mean the author, I don't mean Paul. Uh, is the author trying to make it sound like the letter is coming from the sheriff or coming from someone that was actually prosecuting Paul in some way? Uh, I don't know. Just that, that section in the middle about when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? Um, if nothing else, it's alluding to the fact that this letter writer was writing to Paul previous to this, and I really haven't heard any mention of that before, uh, or that this person was having a conversation with Paul, maybe even face to face. And I haven't heard him really give out any theories um, about who that would be necessarily. So moving over to mysteriousuniverse.org, we get a little bit of insight into uh, someone else that might have seen who was setting up that booby trap. Mary Gillespie told the sheriff, one of the other bus drivers told her that she had been driving that same road about 20 minutes before Mary Gillespie found that booby trap at exactly that site. And when she went by that very same intersection, there was a yellow El Camino parked there. A large man with sandy hair was standing there. When he saw her come, he turned around and act, acted like he was going to the bathroom or something, but seemed also to be avoiding any kind of identification. The description of the individual does not fit Paul Freshour at all, and Paul had a very solid alibi for this time. There was no attempt at all to follow up on that lead. If they had, they would have found that another possible suspect in this case had a brother who had a yellow El Camino. Um, so here we're getting some other potential angles. Um, could someone accidentally mistake someone's hair for being sandy versus the dark hair that Paul had? Possibly, but there is some footprint analysis that is done at the scene. Uh, I saw in Paul's documentation, he actually has some notes from someone that was hired to analyze those footprints. And it seems like Paul's foot is far too small to be the same shoe that made those footprints. So there is some pretty good question here about was he really that person or not? And who could the owner of that yellow El Camino be? Uh, well, let's press on forward here. 
And since we're covering an Unsolved Mysteries case, why not get some info from unsolvedmysteries.wikia.com. Uh, once again, we can see they've got a little slideshow of the letters here um, showing some of what I question in terms of maybe there was more than one letter writer. Um, we've just got some very different type of text going on between a couple of these letters, but let's get some more detail. Uh, Ron received a phone call from the alleged writer. The call seemed to confirm Ron's suspicions on the identity of the writer. He grabbed his gun and left in his pickup truck, even though the writer claimed to be watching the truck. A few minutes later, Ron was found dead. So I just wanted to let you guys hear how it was worded uh, by Unsolved Mysteries. Um, I don't know if you can really support that information. Uh, only his children were there apparently, and he told his children uh, that he was leaving. Um, I don't think he said to his kids, you know, hey, yeah, I found out who this guy is. I'm going to grab my gun and go confront him. So I don't know where this assumption quite comes from. Uh, several residents soon received letters stating that Sheriff Radcliffe had been involved in a cover-up. And once again, if you look at Paul's information that he sent to the FBI, it's lining up with the type of content that the writer is sending out to the public, talking about the sheriff being involved in a cover-up. Um, apparently, this is a second-generation Radcliffe to be in that role, and the Radcliffe family has been sheriffs in this area. Um, it was for like 60 or 70 years or something. So uh, is it potentially you know, a family that's been in power a little too long that might have gone corrupt? Um, I think it's something that should be considered. The trap had a box which contained a small pistol. If Mary had pulled the sign off a certain way, the gun would have fired. Uh, I have a big question about that because how bad was this trap? Um, that it didn't fire. And even in some of the court documentation, there, there is, um, there's constant notes about how shoddy this trap was. Um, what is the likelihood that she would be able to pull it down? She didn't realize that it was a trap. Uh, she didn't realize that until she got home. And even then she didn't believe the gun was real. So the way that she was treating that object uh, I can't imagine that she was being gentle because she thought something might go wrong or that there could be an explosive or something like that in there. Oh, and by the way, she's taking it onto a school bus with a bunch of kids. It really makes no sense. So um, some people do question the trap. Was it even at that location to begin with? Uh, did Mary possibly have this at her home? Is she involved in some way in this setup? Uh, something very interesting that happened around this is... Paul and his wife wound up separating and getting a divorce, and his wife moved onto the property uh, that Mary lived on. And apparently Mary and his ex-wife uh, were very close. And if you think about this, who would have access potentially to a weapon that was owned by Paul? His ex-wife certainly would. Um, now keep in mind, the ex-wife of Paul is actually Ron's sister. So she could also be a suspect in this herself. There's When you start looking into this, it's just like a spider web of possibilities. And every one you go out on, it just branches off into more and more uh, different directions. It was determined that the gun had belonged to Paul Freshour, uh, who had recently separated from Ron's sister. Paul, however, claimed that the gun had been stolen. And I don't know if it was great for him to claim that the gun had been stolen versus I don't know where it is because apparently he stored this gun in his garage. Um, and because he claimed that it was stolen, when he eventually was up for trial, they will they were able to ask, well, did you report this as stolen? And of course, uh, police were able to go through those records and say, no, we never had any report that a gun had been stolen from this guy. So uh, that just him phrasing that he thought that the, the gun could have been stolen was probably not the smartest thing for him. Paul took Sheriff Radcliffe to his garage and showed him where he kept his gun. Uh, one of the other interesting things is when they were there, um, the prosecutor, the defense asked the sheriff, hey, while you were there, did you notice any ammo for this gun? Did you find ammo where this gun was stored? No. Then they started going into the materials that made up the booby trap. Did you find this type of twine? Did you see this type of box? Did you see... And the, the sheriff was just replying, no, 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 no. So basically, 
all the items that it would take to build this booby trap that hopefully you would think they would try to trace back to their original locations. None of that stuff was found at Paul's home. On top of that, according to Paul's documentation, no, there was no fingerprints of his found on any of it, including his own gun. Really, really bizarre. Although he was never charged with writing the threatening letters, they became a crucial part of the evidence against him. A handwriting expert testified that Paul was the letter writer. Mary also testified that she believed that he was the writer after his wife visited her with the same suspicion. Okay, so just keep this in mind. We've got a guy going through a divorce and all of a sudden his wife, who might be the letter writer herself and might already have a way of knowing about this affair, is going to the woman supposedly having this affair and saying, hey, it could be my husband that's writing these letters. Paul's boss also testified that he was not at work on the day that the booby trap was found. Um, however, Paul did have an alibi for most of the day. Uh, however, he did not take the stand in his own defense Probably another mistake, particularly if he was innocent, but I know that it depends on legal strategy. There's all kinds of other different considerations that, that come into play there. Uh, in terms of it being aired on Unsolved Mysteries, the original air date for this episode was November 11th, 1994. Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe and Mary Gillespie declined to be interviewed for the story. I'll have a link to um, the Dennis Farina episode in the description box below, and you'll see Paul is interviewed and speaks a lot throughout the story. Uh, so you can check that out for yourself. Recent information uncovered by Martin Yant and others has suggested that there were at least three letter writers involved in the case, none of whom were Paul. One was believed to be the son of the superintendent, who Mary had an affair with. Um, what's interesting about that is in some versions of this story, uh, they talk about the letters being somewhat different and that some of the early letters were signed with a W. Uh, the superintendent's son's name is William. So it is possible that he could have been a writer of possibly some of the early letters only, maybe all the letters, but definitely that he could have been responsible for the letters directly talking about the affair. And when you think about the intent of this person and these letters that are being sent, why do they want this affair to end? I mean, that's what they're being very clear about. They want the affair to end. They want, when, when that doesn't seem to work, they go to Ron and they want him to conduct his own investigation and to tell the school board about it. Uh, it seems to me that the intent of this person to have that affair end would be probably to protect the superintendent's wife, uh, which Either it could have been the wife herself that was writing these letters or one of her children if they knew that this was going on. Uh, outside of that, it could have been someone that might have been interested in Mary. Maybe was she having more than one affair? Could have also been someone that was also interested in the superintendent. Could there have been someone else that he was having an affair with that found out about Mary and maybe he wasn't spending any time with the first girl anymore and she got mad and started writing these letters? Um, it's just, I'm telling you guys, it's a spider web. The second was to believe to be a co-worker who was infatuated with Mary. The third was believed to be Paul's ex-wife, Ron Gillespie's sister. It is believed that the ex-wife's boyfriend was the man seen next to the El Camino on the day that the booby trap was discovered. One of her relatives had owned that type of car at the time. And the assumption here is that she borrowed the El Camino, but her boyfriend actually drove it and used that to go set up the sign and or the sign and the booby trap, um, which is a really interesting twist. And the reporter that's talking about this, Martin Yant, notes that once he started releasing information about that yellow Camino the reporter started getting death threats and threats of being sued. Um, when I'm looking at this in hindsight of you know researching this, uh, Paul's ex-wife seems somewhat suspicious to me. Uh, outside of that, if you look through all of Paul's documentation, it's really strange because 
there's this thing where it seems like he doesn't want to consider that or he doesn't really go into the possibility that it was ex, his ex-wife that was doing this. That would have been the perfect defense for him if he was in court. If he knew that his ex-wife was doing this, he could have brought that up and completely blown out this whole case, but he didn't. So to me, I'm wondering, was he protecting her for some reason? Maybe because he was part of it in some way? Maybe he didn't write the letters. Maybe she was the one writing the letters, but maybe he was helping her to investigate. Like maybe she caught wind that Mary was having this affair and he went and found out about it. If you read through what he wrote in that large document, he has some pretty intense detail about this affair. He knows where they would go on their halfway point um, when they were going off together to go stop, have a drink. He knows a lot of detail about the mechanics of how that affair works. So could he have been kind of like the private eye for his wife? And then his wife was the letter writer and then he didn't want her to get nailed. But then you consider that they go through a breakup and they get divorced and essentially he wins everything. He gets the kids, he gets the house, he gets to keep his money. But then when he gets busted and he gets charged, all that goes back to her. Even his pension went to her. Wouldn't he be mad enough at that point to come clean and say, I know who did this. It was my wife that was doing this the whole time, my ex-wife. Well, in his documentation, he also states um, at one point that if you talk to her about things now, that there's no way she's going to lie because she has since become religious. There are another set of letters that that come out way after all this goes down. Uh, we're not sure if it's the same writer or not, because once again, the font has changed. This person is now claiming that uh, they know how the original writer was writing, and they explain that font. They say that there are more booby traps that have not been found or at least weren't being reported by the authorities. And they specifically state that the old letters were written by a teacher named Mary. And they say that I told you about Mary because Jesus is with me now. I think it's pretty interesting and maybe a little more than coincidental that you have Paul talking about his ex-wife saying, oh yeah, she's religious now, so I would absolutely trust what she says. And then you have these new letters being delivered where someone is claiming, hey, I'm telling you about this because I'm religious now. And I have not seen anyone make that connection. Uh, now, I haven't read through every single bulletin board there is out there on this, but I'm just, I find that connectivity really, really interesting. I think that there could be something to that. Um, is his wife possibly only responsible for those last few letters written in a different font? Maybe, maybe she's trying to throw the, the investigation in a different direction. I don't know. I don't know. Understanding the motivation, the motivations in this case is really, really tough because there seems to be so much going on. Now, uh, Sitcoms Online does have a bulletin board thread uh, going on this case. There's actually two separate threads. I'll have links to both of them down below. Really, really interesting reads. A lot of great theories going on in these. Uh, a couple of areas where it looks like family members potentially kicking in. Uh, it's tough. I don't know if they're believable or not. Um, this one in particular is kind of interesting because it does call out. He says that he is the grandson of Paul. And it calls out that his grandmother's name is Karen. And that information isn't very widely known. In a lot of these conversations, people don't even seem to know the name of the superintendent, which is uh, Gordon Massey. Um, but if you dig into Paul's documentation enough, you can get all these details. So I don't know about the family, quote, family that, that is speaking on these threads, if that stuff's very reliable. But the rest of the threads are really interesting. And I was able to find links to a lot of other information, which I think is definitely uh, worth your time if you're going to look into this case. Now, uh, in another thread on sitcoms online, The Cars 1986, who's a senior member, and I believe I've talked about this account uh, on the channel before. Um, I really like their, their way of thinking and breaking things down. Uh, they reached out to the investigator slash journalist uh, that had his life threatened, Martin Yant, and they got a bit of a news story from him. And this is as of... Um, April of 2016. So let's see what this theory is about. 
Uh, it's interesting to note here that the letters they were receiving were written in two different forms. Some were written with a large block style writing, and others were written with a more normal style and were signed W. Gordon Massey's son was named William. They wrote, according to Paul, four or five letters to him and that there was no violence in them or anything, just that we knew who he was and what he was doing, and we sent him the letters. Then the letters stopped. In the summer of 1977 is when Ron Gillespie received the phone call, which ultimately resulted in his death. Fast forward to 1983, which is when Mary Gillespie would see signs along her bus route that targeted her daughter. This is when she eventually found the booby trap attached to a sign. Should be noted that in 1982, Fresh Hour and his wife went through a messy divorce and Fresh Hour kept their house and custody of their children. Not once during the proceedings did his wife mention anything about him being the writer. Then, after the divorce was finalized, his ex-wife moved in, into a trailer on the property where Mary Gillespie lived, and it was only after finding the booby trap that his ex began to claim he was responsible for writing the letters. Another worker for the school system had repeatedly made advances to Mary, which she rebuffed. When she began the affair with the superintendent, this made the guy jealous. All of the initial letters targeted the affair, and the initial letters were written in two different forms. In my opinion, the son of Gordon Massey wrote some, while the jealous co-worker wrote the others. It should be noted that Paul Freshour lived in a different county altogether and worked at a beer plant 50 hours a week. There's just no way he would have known the numerous people in Circleville, let alone intimate details about their lives. Now, what is interesting about where Paul worked is apparently he was in the right uh, city for sending the letters. So he could have potentially been sending the letters from work. But uh, Martin Yant's description of her uh, in terms of Paul's ex-wife, quote, she was a very, very angry, manipulative woman who was still planting negative stories about Paul in the early 1990s. One final tidbit, the co-worker was charged with the rape of a young girl and while on the run committed suicide. So this is a bit of a different spin because we have the co-worker in this case being someone that Mary uh, knew and that was attracted to Mary. Uh, um, I don't know if it could have been the flip situation that may maybe this was a coworker that was also dating the superintendent, but in any regard, the letters do seem to circle around the school, at least this particular batch of letters. And it's tough because as I told you guys, there was over a thousand letters sent. However, for letters that wind up in this story and that are discussed in this story or that you can actually find for yourself, it's probably less than half a dozen. So it's hard to know uh, the scope of these letters, did they get into other people's personal lives as deeply as they did into the Gillespie's or not? Um, it's very, very hard to answer. But once again, uh, a different twist on a possibility there and just an interesting note about Paul's wife. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, um, Paul died at the age of 70, June 28th, 2012. Uh, his obituaries here just mentions that uh, he had also served in the U.S. Army. He was a graduate of Franklin University, received a master's degree from Central Michigan University. Uh, this is a guy that was educated. Um, would he have made a bad decision in terms of trying to use a gun where he tried to file off the serial number but didn't do a good enough job and they were still able to trace it back to him? I struggle with that. Uh, seems like he was probably a bit more educated and maybe a little smarter than doing something like that. Um, have the letters stopped now that Paul is dead? Yes, but they actually stopped a little bit before that as well. Um, they did go on through the entire time that he was in prison. I'm not sure how long they went after he was released. Um, but you had them consistently happen while he was in prison. And I don't know what was the catalyst for the letters ending. If it really was this other person that um, Mr. Yant was talking about, this person that might have been enamored with Mary, uh, that killed himself when he was on the run, uh, maybe that's why the letters stopped. Maybe the letters didn't serve Paul anymore once he was out of prison. And that's why the letters stopped. I don't know. I really don't know what the catalyst is for that. 
Were the letters sent by someone who wanted to protect Gordon's marriage, like one of his family members, or someone that wanted to end Mary's relationship with him, like one of her family members, or someone else just interested in her? Was she possibly having more than one affair, or could she have had an admirer? They do seem to be trying to end the affair and her marriage by sending a letter to her husband. Could it have been someone else that Gordon was having an affair with? Um, and I think that's where I have to leave it. I, I just, I don't know who else would be in consideration outside of that. It's someone with interpersonal knowledge of Mary and her family uh, and what's going on with her outside of her family. Uh, so in a way, I feel like it's someone that cares a lot and is close to either her or Ron or Gordon, the guy that she is also sleeping with, or possibly Gordon's wife. But it's someone that is close to this love triangle that is going on. I want to throw that your way and ask your opinions on it. Let's talk about it in the comment box below. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me on this episode. I know it was a bit of a bear to go through. There was a lot to cover in this one, um, but I really liked digging into it. I liked that there was multiple layers to find. There's kind of the blog version of this story. Uh, there is the thread version of this story. And then there's Paul's extremely long document um, version of the story. So there's a lot to try to cross-reference and support or refute information from other stories. Uh, a lot going on with this one. So feel free to dive in. Plenty of links for you in the description box below. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you back here on Monday on the Lord Lunch channel.